The college football season started. Too bad UConn didn't know until it was too late. You're locked on UConn. You are locked on UConn, your daily podcast on the UConn Huskies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On UConn your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Before we dive into today's show, I, I just want to make a quick moment to ask you for a small favor. If you're enjoying the content here, please take a second to subscribe to the show and follow the audio versions as well wherever you get your podcasts. It, it helps in every single way. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your support. It means the world to me, and it helps keep us going strong every day. Thank you so much for being part of the Locked On UConn community. Today's episode is brought to you by 5-Hour Energy. It fixes tired fast. With zero sugar and a convenient portable size, it's the perfect pickup for me for me, and for getting stuff done. Go to 5-HourEnergy.com and use the promo code LOCKEDONCFB to receive 20% off your order. This offer is only valid until September 30th on one order and cannot be used with other promotions. So go to 5renergy.com today and check it out. Well, UConn fans, what an outright debacle of an opener for the Huskies. I mean, I don't even know. I know exactly where to begin. They got outgained 629 to 310. And if I were being honest with ourselves, with me and anybody that's listening or followed that game, it wasn't even that close. And the majority of our bigger chunk plays happened when the game was already all sewed up. So as much as I love Skylar Bell, and we're going to talk about him, and I think there's a lot of great upside for him. I mean, Maryland's Billy Edwards played about, what, 55%, 60% of the game, had 311 yards passing and two touchdowns. We gave up 250 yards rushing to whomever really wanted to rush the ball. If, If you were in a Maryland uniform and you rushed the ball, we gave up six or seven yards a play. Um, they had like four running backs, plus their court, court, they played three quarterbacks, um, two pretty significantly. And it, it just it just shared in the frustration. And uh, it just it just a it was just an outright just ridiculous display. I mean, for a team that's trying to make investments in college football and try to get back to where they were, say, 2010. It just really was a, a, a nice gut punch for uh, the college football season. But good thing there's 11 more games to go. And (laughs) we are going to bring in uh, Greg Davis from uh, the the founder of Sons of Nutmeg Tailgate Crew and uh, and, and really kind of talk through what an absolute debacle this was last Saturday. All right, you're back on Locked On UConn. Through the magic of podcasting, we bring in Greg Davis, founder of Sons of Nutmeg Tailgate. Greg, I called the game a debacle. Uh, what, how would you describe the first game of the season? Yeah, hey, thanks for having me, Mark. I, I think, yeah, it was it was definitely a unprepared-looking Husky team. Um, you know, they they struggled in the entire game, obviously, but especially late on, you know, against second and third string defenses and offenses and, the whole thing was a mess. Uh, Coach Mora definitely said that in his, you know, post game presser too. He was wasn't excited about the energy of the team, the lack of enthusiasm, et cetera. But they should have been more prepared for for this. They knew what was coming up. They knew they had, you know, fifty one new guys on the roster. Um, like it or not, that was that was what they were going to play with, right? So uh, it was it was bad from start to finish, with small small glimmers of hope. I think you know from I try to take. When I, when I watch a game, it's like, all right, what can we look forward till next week, right? Is there something sure. after the game we can take? There wasn't a whole heck of a lot out of this one. No, there really wasn't. I mean, um, <laughs> I think the, 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 the game in, the micro, in a microcosm was, you know, first drive of the game, Maryland's driving. Billy, uh, Billy Edwards is, you know, that fumble that, that we didn't get the call on. I truly don't think he was – I truly think he was down, so I think they actually got the call right. But the frustration on it was there really wasn't a clear angle that you could see when they called it a fumble on the field. So I thought we were going to get that call. And then, of course, on the very next play, they score a touchdown. So they really – in in any sport, the anatomy of an upset, you got to get some breaks too, and they got zero breaks. Like They got – 
they got no breaks on on calls. They got no breaks on on um, you know maybe a guy you know just missing a perfect pass. They Maryland was prepared. They they came in and they did not they did not feel like they were going to let UConn feel like they had any chance in this game. Um, so I feel like that was also frustrating. But um, just what about I mean for me. Blocking and tackling, man, the fundamentals of the game, like all the only the two, two things that you can't go without in football. You can't not block and you can't not tackle. So is that all on, that's got to be all on the coaching staff? I mean, I know these kids, it's it's their job to to you know block and tackle as well. But man, that was that was the most frustrating thing I watched all game. Yeah, I, I agree. There was a ton of missed tackles, you know, especially you known for having solid secondaries, right? Like when have we not had a solid you know, secondary. It, that's what we've been known for, if, if nothing mm-hmm. else. You know, up front, you know, regardless. But it, it was it wasn't great. We missed a lot of tackles. And I don't know if that's, you know, partially because the new uh you know Brock brought in the new three three five defense, but maybe we're not fast enough to run that. I don't know. It seemed it seemed like there was there was an issue there or lack of communication or what have you. But um you know without Ronte Jones, you know, he's kind of the leader of that backfield in the first half that hurt them, I think. And then quickly in the second half, he gets the targeting call. Right. And then he's out, yep. he's out again. So that was not great. We saw Jordan Wright go down too with the other targeting call, which, you know, that one was, that one was a rough one. Um, and now they're going to be out for the first half of Merrimack too. So another, another loss. It was just, it was just one thing after another. I mean, I, I it was even that touchdown late. It was like, uh, great. You know, yeah, you know, hard to even get excited about because of how bad the team performed otherwise. Uh, and granted, I, you know they were down by thirty points at that point or whatever it was. But well, the only the only good news, and this is all this is all personal for me, but I actually took a uh, a flyer on TJ Sheffield <laughs> anytime <laughs> touchdown for like twenty bucks, and I made two hundred dollars off of that. So hey, that was nice. That was yeah. nice. Uh, so I appreciated that from 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 the Huskies, but. Uh, don't I don't and that's the thing I don't do much betting so it was so random and then that's so their one touchdown was the one I picked I guess right yeah. um to me uh I think the other frustrating thing for me was I I, I kind of t- took a screenshot I can't add it to the to the to the video people are watching on YouTube but the first three possessions of the game and it was a it literally was kind of something that I thought was a theme in when you have a defense that is just getting run up and down the field on your offense has to give them a break. You know right. what I mean? Like you have yeah. to have some sustained drive, even if you don't score points, just to give them an opportunity to take a breath. Exactly. And yeah. we had zero of that. Like there was, yep. and I also thought, you know, we did this big preview last week and the week before on what this offense is going to look like. I truly thought this this team was going to be a little, little more mixture of run and pass play action, a little more RPO with Nick Evers. And it just never felt like, he didn't also get any any help from his receivers. A lot of mm-hmm. drop passes. Yeah. Uh, I also didn't think that the offense gave him easier outs. Right there wasn't a, there weren't these little quick outs where maybe they could break a tackle like with Scott right. Bell. It was like I just I just felt like it was they were trying to do too much with an offense that is trying to gel with a new quarterback and new interior yeah. offensive line, and that right. felt incredibly off for me. But what were your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I think we heard this this summer, right? Like Gordy Sams just came out and said, "Hey, we're going to be a mix of run and and uh, and pass, and you're going to see us air the ball out." Which we, you know, as a fan base, that's all we've been asking for for the past decade. Please make it fun, air the ball out. And they've said time and time again this summer, this is the deepest receiving core we've had in years, maybe. Right? We turned, we returned what two two receivers, I think, from last year's roster. Everyone else is yep. brand new. We brought in Skylar Bell from Wisconsin. We brought in, uh, you know, um, uh, TJ Sheffield from Purdue. We had all these weapons to throw to. And you had Nick Evers, who was touted to be this, you know, right, this the second coming. Uh, I, I think Evers, he looked okay. Yeah. I mean, I saw him in the, in the, in the spring game practice and in another open practice I went to. I wasn't impressed. Honestly, I was not impressed by him. And I know he was at the time he was banged up. He had like a groin injury or something. Um, and so they, you know, they were given more snaps to, to uh, you know, the other quarterbacks. I, I, you know, you had to start him. I think, right. Like they, they brought him here for a reason. They paid money for him in NIL to bring him here. You had to start him. And I think you stick with him. I think, you know, give him a, give him a chance to again, gel with the receivers, 
he's still probably learning the offense, to be honest, right? You know, he's only been here since, what, April? So mm -hmm. there's some of that, too. But I agree. I think the old line needs to block better for him. They, they, were, they were better than, than last year in a lot of games. But they didn't set up the run. And that was a big, a big part, too. When have we had an offense that didn't establish a strong run game? And yesterday it was, it was one or two yards a game, you know, two or three maybe. But then we'd go right back, like you said, three and out and punt. Uh, and and I, I think that wore down the defense early on. And then, you know, as, as you know, in the second half, when they, you're facing, you know, basically Maryland second second stringers, you know, the defense was just so gassed. I think it was tough for them to, to react to. So and again, with a new defense running the three, three, five um, under Brock, I think that's, you know, there's a there's an adjustment there, too. And, and, and a lot of learning going on kind of on the fly, which isn't great. So. You know, I think you stick with Evers. Hopefully, he's ready to go for for next week. Um, I, you know, they brought in Figiano, and I I liked his poise coming in, and and like he was cool under pressure, came right in, and honestly commanded the offense better, I think, than than Evers did. You know, he's he stepped right up, and he was completing passes. We didn't see that in the first half, um, and you know, he was able to step in. So maybe he goes with him for Maryland if if Evers is banged up. Um, you know, we'll have to see. I think it's not a terrible, you know, a, a terrible thing to start him. But, yeah, I, I'd like to see more of the receivers. You know, again, with, with all these weapons that we have, we've brought in and, and retooled, you, you wanted to see him air it out more and complete complete more passes. Plus, you've got, you know, the tight ends that are all healthy. I think we had, what, one completion to, to a tight end all game. So, um, yeah, we got to see more out of that to, to move the ball. For sure. We're going to talk who our player of the game was. It's pretty obvious it was Skylar Bell coming up after this. Five-hour energy. Ever hit that afternoon slump and just can't seem to push it through? Trust me, I've been there. I've been called the yawning podcaster, for Christ's sake. You know, that's that's what I've reached, a five-hour energy shot. It's my go-to tackling uh, that end of the end of the day list of powering through a workout when motivation's low and whether I'm catching the big game or staying up late, it keeps me alert and in the zone. Plus, with zero sugar and flavors like watermelon and tropical burst, there's something for everyone. Head over to their website where you can even customize your own 12, 12 or 24 pack. So whatever you're waiting for, try five hour energy today. OK, we're back with Greg Davis from founders of founder of the Sons of Nutmeg Tailgate. Um, yeah, uh, Skylar Bell, definitely the bright spot. I would say the lone bright spot. And I, I think you put Fayano in that too, just for a, for the fact that he came in and, and did a, a pretty nice job in, in I don't want to say mop-up duty. It was, it was At that point, the game was almost out of reach. I, I'm trying to think of exactly when Nick went out. It was kind of a, all of a blur yesterday. A lot of frustration in, in my 18-month-old my son looking at me going, are we clapping or am I getting, you know, like what am I supposed to do here? So I was, yeah. not, I was not happy with the television. So yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I also thought. I mean, I also like. I, I don't mean to go on a tangent, but Cam, I thought Cam Edwards looked good on in the minimal times that he actually carried the ball. Like every yeah. time he was off a right tackle, and he taking off left left tackle, seven yards here, boom, and they'd go away from him. So we'll get into play calling in the next segment. But Skylar Bell was a lone bright spot. I thought we should have used him more. But do you think? Do you think there's more? Do there, you think that he had more success because? of Maryland probably putting in second and third string guys, or do you think that they, do you think that that may have maybe had something to do with it? I'm not trying to take anything away from the kid. He had a great game, but do you think that's part of it or give me your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that could be a little, a little bit of it. I think the timing with, with Evers seemed off, uh, you know, there yeah. was some, some missed opportunities where he was open. It seemed, and they just couldn't get the ball to him, you know, whether that was because of he was, you know, Evers being pressured or didn't have enough time in the pocket, whatever it might be. Um, we saw a few runs from Evers, which was nice. I wanted to see more RPO, though, really. Yeah, and and you know, but you know, it, it was it was uh, it was interesting. Let's say that. I think there's, I think yeah, and you're right. Skylar Bell was definitely a player of the game. TJ Sheffield, I think, would get, give him a you know two A <laughs> or a one A one B kind of kind of thing. I think obviously he had the touchdown. There's lots to be hopeful about with the two of them. I believe as we move forward. Um, I'm glad we have them because otherwise this this would not have looked good. 
on offense. And it didn't, it didn't look great at all. Right. And there's tons to work on. So I think you got to go back to the drawing board this week, figure out what worked, figure out what didn't again, try to establish that run. Um, and, and I agree with your last point too, you know, uh, Cam Edwards, especially early on, did have some nice breakouts. We never saw that like kind of second level run game, right? Yeah. We saw him, he'd gain a few yards, but it was a lot of like up the middle. There was one call later on in the game and Samson's called like a, like a run up the middle and it was third and seven. And it was like, they needed to convert it run up the middle. Hadn't been working all day. Why would you go right up the middle? Nothing off tackle. You know, we didn't see any kind of pitches or, you know, where you could gain some more open space. So to me, I mean, it was just, just a lot of missed opportunity there. Um, but yeah, Scott, Bell, glad, glad we have him on the roster. I think he'll be a nice piece of this offense as we move forward. Yeah. And I, and listen, I, I understand cause I'm, I'm actually going back through my Twitter feed and understanding that, you know, sometimes, you know, when you say things on Twitter, people take it as like, you know, gospel, like whatever, but yeah. you know, it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, do we need to be patient with this team because of all the new guys? Absolutely. Is this going to happen overnight with UConn football uh, competing against Big Ten teams? Probably not. But the but the frustrating thing I see, and I was going to save this more for the last segment, but who cares? Let's talk about it right now. But the you know the if you look across the landscape of college football, because I watched college football all day yesterday. I'm off. Yep. My, my 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 wife was working, so it was just me and my boys, and we just watched football yep. and hung out. And guess what? There were a lot of competitive games against teams that probably you know shouldn't be competitive. Even if you go back to Thursday, yeah, NC State's got a good football team. They're ranked in the top twenty-five. They played a SoCon team in Western Carolina that had yep. a lead in the fourth quarter. So you're trying to tell me that UConn, who's not an FCS school, this wasn't a buy game. This was a game where you were supposed to go in and compete against yep. a Big Ten team. And this yep. isn't Michigan. We talked about this pre-show. Maryland had. 35,000 of an 80,000 uh, stadium. It's not like you had a raucous crowd there kind of like, you know, uh, uh, attacking them like, oh, you know, it, it, they can't. They, there's all kinds of false starts because, yeah. you know, we, we couldn't get the, the – it, it, you can add all of these little elements on. And it's just – that to me goes back to your word to start the, the show, un underprepared, and that's unacceptable. If, if – Jim Mora is going to sit there and tell us that he needs more NIL to compete and then he gets it and he doesn't compete. That's a failure. Yeah, no, I agree. And they raised the money. That's the thing. You look at the NIL covers. There was that article that came out. I think it was like Thursday or Friday this week. You know, uh, they had raised what a million dollars, million, million, 1.25 million. They're on target, hopefully to, to get to two, two and a half by next season, which would yeah. put us, put us like easily in the top 10. I'd, I'd imagine in group of five, I saw some numbers, you know, and, and honestly, even within the, the power four, you know, somewhere in that range, which is phenomenal for UConn, that's what we need. And that's what changes the narrative of UConn doesn't take football seriously and UConn isn't ready for the next level and blah, 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 blah. Um, that, and I hate that narrative. I hate it. And I, and I, not to get off on, on the big 12 rumors and expansion, but that's, that's been the story. Right. And it, sure. I think it's up, it's up to the fan base uh, to help to quill that story and change that narrative. But the team's got to be there to back that up as well, right? And so when we show up on a game like this, like you're right, the first game of the season, national television, there's eyes on it. Obviously, there's there's because of the Big 12, you know, rumors in the past couple of weeks, that that narrative is, is out there and people are looking at UConn. And it's like, oh, same old UConn, you yep. know, same, same old story. They're in a they're in another rebuild or whatever it is. And and yes, partially they are, right? Well, again, 51 new players in the roster. A lot of those are starters, right? But they gotta be they gotta be more prepared than than they were. Uh and, and I agree. They they just weren't prepared. I think I think Moro took a lot of a lot of um onus on himself of that. And at least in the post-game interviews I heard on on uh on the you know in, on radio and et cetera. But you know, they, they got to go back this week and really, really dive in and figure out what what are they missing here? Uh, and, you know, how do they get these guys amped up for 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 a, an easy win against a a, a Merrim, an FCS Merrimack team that, you know, didn't didn't show a heck of a lot against Air Force last night. I watched that game, too. Um, and we should easily be able to contain them 
score points and and easily get a W, you know, next Saturday at the rent. So we'll we'll see what happens. But you know, I agree with you. I think it's it's up to the coaching staff. Uh, the players are going to play, and obviously they play all the you know all the snaps. They can't go out there and run the ball for them and pass and throw and 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 tackle. But um, they got these guys amped up for for next Saturday. Well. Yeah, I mean, there's a you know what what do we call that? That's a get right game. Let the, you know, there's a yeah. there's there's an opportunity to get right and and kind of steer the ship before it gets too far down south. Uh, the last thing they need is a is a competitive game against Merrimack because if that happens, then people are going to go. I'm not even going to. I'm just going to yeah. start tuning out. A- you know, absolutely. Because, and and I did a um, as a part of a segment of a show probably a week and a half ago. I did the rundown of their of their schedule. I watched Duke this weekend struggle yep. against Elon. I watched Wake Forest struggle for a half against a t which is a really good FCS program. Right. Um, UConn has some opportunities to get some eyeballs on their program with competitive or potential wins against big time opponents. Yeah, but or big time for them, like you know power conferences. I don't think I feel less confident after this weekend's it, games. Yeah. That they're gonna they're gonna do that, but I and a lot I, of those I'm, are at home too, right? That's the yeah. other thing. Like you know, again, we've got te- Temple. They did, obviously they played Oklahoma. Okay, they scored three. <laughs> but, you know, obviously they're gonna smack. They, yeah, they. I mean, but like again, that's a winnable game for us. If they show up like that, you would think again with the offense it, and I don't even focus on the defense, but I think with the, they'll get it right. I think they got the weapons and they got the bodies up front, especially offensively. Though they got to put up points. And, and that's what it all comes down to. And it has, honestly, for the last few years, UConn has, has been scoring and the yeah. inability to, to score. And, and that's, I think, what, what you know, the onus was this offseason with bringing in guys who can put up production and, and put points on the board. Um, but, yeah, you're right. Like, you look at some of these games this, this week, you know, against teams that are on our schedule that all struggle, teams that were good, like a Duke, for example, against an FCS school that – they shouldn't have been in, you know, in the in the game. Um, but even some of those, you know, the you know the lesser schools, like I said, te- the Temples, the um, you know, obviously Merrimack, uh, FAU. You know, they they lost, a, but they put up against Michigan State. I don't know if you saw that. You look great. Yeah, yeah. So that's a scary game. Uh, Georgia State lost last night to to Georgia Tech. They're two and zero, which is insane. But um, another one that we we had a tough time with last year, and you know, and didn't get it done. So. So we'll see, you know, um, I think going into the season, my prediction was, you know, six and six, maybe seven and five in a bowl. But if they, if there's nothing to take out of yesterday aside from Skylar Bell and, and it, you know, that you can say like, oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to put up points. We're going to score and easily be able to beat these, these teams we should beat on the schedule. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, we're going to take one more break and then talk about what to look forward to next week. and also. Maybe talk about, does this team have a lack of discipline after yesterday's game? We'll talk to Greg about that coming up after this. Hey, UConn fans, I want to take a moment to give you a heads up on a brand new mobile game. I think you're going to love as much as I do, Ultimate College Football HC. It's this amazing game and simulation. You get to step into the shoes of a head coach and lead your college football program to glory. Can you imagine being the head coach of of your UConn Huskies? Probably not last Saturday, but maybe you could have done a better job. From recruiting players and hiring coaching staff to overseeing training camps and handling scholarships, you control every crucial detail of your program. It's all in your hands. Will you be able to handle the pressure? And here's what I really love about it. You're, you're responsible for play calling, which we needed yes, on Saturday. Your strategy will not only determine the success of your football season, but will shape the future legacy of your program. Ultimate College HC is completely free, has no ads, and is 100% playable. To download the game, just visit the college football uh, at ultimatecfb.com or look it up on the app stores. Ultimate College Football HC, begin your college coaching legacy today. Okay, we're back with Greg Davis, founder of Sons of Nutmeg Tailgate. Greg, we've talked about a lot of things today, uh, how unprepared they were. Kind of it was a pretty big debacle for them to lose, you know, to put up, get, get beat by almost 50 points. First game of the college season. My opening, you weren't on for the cold opening. I said college football started uh, Saturday. 
too bad UConn didn't know it uh, because <laughs> yeah. they just didn't show up. I mean, that's just really what it comes yeah. down to. Go back, go back to me about Jim Mora. And do you think this team has a any type of? I know it's early. I know this is coming off of no preseason in college football. All the things that people are going to say when they hear this segment. Is there a discipline problem with this team? Lots of targeting, um, no miss catches, in miss tackles. I, I try. I tried about fifteen different sites to find the yak numbers of yesterday for Maryland. Has to be astronomical. Um, yeah. W- what are your thoughts? Yeah, I I agree. I think I think discipline was an issue. Again, they weren't prepared. They didn't. They weren't energetic. They weren't excited. It seemed that you know maybe early on, but it just. It wasn't there, right? Um, the the Maryland offense looked like you know they were playing you know Ohio State you know against an FCS school, uh, unfortunately. And uh, again, I go back to the, that's the story we're going to bring forward. So it's it's up to yeah. the team to to I think like Saturday is a reset game against a Merrimack team we know we can beat. We have to show up. We have to put points on the board. So that when people see that ticker on the bottom of their screen next Saturday, and they say, "Oh wow, UConn beat the beat the heck out of out of out of out of, uh, out of Merrimack," and oh, Merrimack only lost what was it twenty one nothing I think or twenty one three maybe they scored a field goal late, uh, or or it was it was six twenty one six they scored a touch on late. You know, UConn's legitimate, and you know they're not a they're not a joke. Um, yeah, I I think you know they, Moore's got to take that into account when he they go back to to the Burton. <laughs> today hopefully and kind of reset things um especially with you know again we, we talked about it in the last segment but like you look at the the schedule moving forward for the rest of the season you saw UMass lost last yesterday um uh, which hopefully that's a win at the end of our season um a lot of the rice lost to Sam Houston which mm-hmm. which was which was crazy good to see and a lot of the other teams you know struggled Syracuse even struggled a little bit against Ohio like yep. Forest struggled um, but but pulled it out. Buffalo got a win, um, but you know didn't look like anything, you know, crazy. Duke struggled against you know their FCS opponent, um, UAB even. So one of the most one of the 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 best schedules we could potentially have to again change the narrative on football, put up a, a quality season, and 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 get to a bowl. And we got to take advantage of it uh, early on here. Maryland, we knew was going to be tough. Yep, think, toughest you know, game of the year. Toughest game. I, of the year. Right. I agree there. I, I I'll give you the only other perspective, and this is I'm I try not to be you know negative on this stuff, but I think the the only other perspective I can give on the uh, our opponents, common opponents, you know, struggling as well. What if it, you know? Wouldn't it have been nice if we were the one of our common opponents that actually you know was competitive? We lost that game like thirty eight to twenty one. Right. Nothing would have made right. me happier to to cover that spread having even not bet on it, but just exactly. to cover it, just, just to kind of show people like, Oh, okay. You, they you can put up a, points. Yeah. Yeah. You played a middle of the road, big 10 school and competed. No problem. But right. at 50 to seven, if Maryland wanted to, they probably could have scored 70 on us Easy. because they Easy. left out. They didn't. Billy Edwards had three eleven, played half a game essentially. Right. And they even, how, how lucky were we that, that we, it, when we were down 14, nothing, they brought in Morris for yeah. a quick, and we got a quick three and out. Yeah, that helped. It was like, yep. thank you, thanks. What a lot. One of the only ones I think we had all day. I'm like, all right, maybe this, maybe that'll change the change the you know right. the moments of the game. And it didn't didn't at all, but you know, it, yeah. So like to me, like that's that's the frustrating part is that like you had an opportunity, you you missed this one. You have a few, you have a bunch more during the year, but the teams that we're talking about, they're only going to get better too. I don't think Duke's going to get worse. I don't think Wake Forest is going to get no. worse. They've been there before. Same thing with Syracuse, um, you know, UMass, like all the yeah. teams we're playing. Yeah, so, yeah. Glenn's going to spill it again. <laughs> we have yeah. we have an outside guest. I like it. Yeah. Um, no. So okay. So tell me what you're it, it, to to feel like to feel like you your the, the ship is right. The get right game is against Merrimack next week. What do you have to see? Last thing we're going to talk about today is what what do you have to see. For, for you to feel better about this football program going into this game and then beyond. Yeah, I think it's really going to be, right, put, putting points on the board early, you know, command the tempo of the game, um, sc- score early and and continue to score, right, and establish establish a run um, I, I think is important. And then on, on the defensive side, I think it's 
stop them in the line of scrimmage as much as you can. You know, you saw Air Force yes last night against Merrimack be able to do that. They had tons of – I mean, they, they were three and out every snap, um, and they were able to, to contain them, which I think is, is key. Their quarterback is pretty mobile um, from the looks of it, but I think it's – you know, they're, they're definitely beatable. I think that's the, the the two things. Not don't give them the big chunk plays, and you know, and an open open field downfield as well. You know, make sure the secondary can contain them there, um, which we didn't see really at all against against Maryland. Um, you know, the DBs were were you know giving up yardage left and right, beaten on most of, most of the plays. They had like a few a few blocks, but I mean, it was not much at all. Um, I'd like to see if we could get an interception, um, maybe some points on defense. That would be great. But at, the, at a minimum, score points, limit uh, limit the yardage, you know, Merrimack can get, um, you know, and contain them up front. I think those are the two, two big things I'd like to see for next week. And then obviously just changing the, the, the discipline or the energy around the team, you know, yeah. have them show up, have them be excited. Uh, and, 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 you know, to be fair, maybe, maybe and I'm sure they were excited for the game yesterday, but even Morris said in his post game, you know, we were kind of eyes wide open and we can't be there at this stage in, the, in this program and where we're at. Um, you know, and a lot of these guys have played big time football, right? When you have guys who are to hear. Yeah, ex exactly. You have guys that are transferring from, from P4s and, and, and whatever they played in big games. They know what this is. And again, Maryland's in the middle of the middle of the pack, big 10 team. We should have gone yeah. in there and at least showed up. So it was disappointing not to see. And you're right. If we had scored 17, 21, something like that, and just showed, hey, we could actually put points on the board and not just a touchdown later on in the game, you know, would have felt a little bit better about this one. Because, again, nobody had this as a win on their, on their outlook when they looked at the season. Everyone knew we were going to probably lose the game. But but show us something. So I, I got to think, and, you know, see, seeing on paper the, the guys we put in place and the weapons we have that we can put points together um, – against against a Merrimack squad and then hopefully carry that into the following week against Duke, which we know is going to be tough again. But but even there, you know, they and they showed this week they're they're able to be to be cut up as well. And um, you know, maybe we maybe we can we can put some points up there and surprise some folks and at least just show up <laughs> and then get us Not back enough. right for when we come back home for the the long homestand. So well this has been a good good uh, recap. Um, thanks for making UConn your first listen. Locked on UConn, your first listen today. Now go check on Locked on College Football Podcast. From NIL deals to never-ending conference realignment, Spencer McLaughlin gets you ready for an exciting season on the gridiron. Locked on College Football, part of the Locked on College Podcast Network, your team every day. Greg, thanks so much for being here. This has been another episode of Locked on UConn. I'm your host, Mark Zanetto, asking you to stay locked in, stay connected, make sure your toughness meter is always rising. And as always, Go Huskies.